Well, perspectives are, are really important, and um, if you'll indulge me, perhaps we could engage your, the right side of your brain and think a little bit about perspectives. So perhaps one might uh, have a look at this nice shiny red uh, screen here and imagine an ant on this screen, and this little ant with its antennae zoom right in, you can see their legs, and you can imagine this little ant really doesn't have a great deal of perspective at all. This little ant sees a red world, uh, all he sees to the horizon is red, understands it's shiny, but really doesn't have a great deal of perspective about what's going on in his particular environment. And perhaps if this ant could step back a little bit and understand exactly what this red, shiny material that this ant was running around on, he might understand that there's a beautiful big V12 engine underneath the bonnet um, with some carbon fibre brakes and a, and a vehicle that uh, accelerates um, very, very quickly uh, to 100 kilometres an hour. But of course, perspectives is, is something that um, we unfortunately are not really good at. Um, just as a, a, a plug, this is uh, Kerry Spackman, who's a New Zealand author, that you might want to have a look at that book on. Perspectives for us as humans is really very difficult. We always are bound by our own confirmation bias and, and really to try and deal with the, um, the facts with regards to what the actual facts say is really a difficult thing for us to step back in, in a perspective. Really, we spend a lot of time over in what confirms our belief systems and every now and again we manage to overlap. Now, this has been very evident in pulmonary arterial hypertension um, over the years, and, and this, this is an expanding prevalence, if you like, of pulmonary hypertension over the years from when a, a group of physicians that pulled together the first French registry felt that there was about 15 patients per million. But in fact, over time, as we've looked further and further and, and stepped back a little bit and opened our perspectives, we've understood that, in fact, uh, data that we published a few years ago, that, in fact, pulmonary hypertension in all causes probably exists in about 326 cases per 100,000, um, quite a, a staggering difference between our original perspectives on what this disease may in fact hold. And this, this fact of perspective is, is not highlighted more than in, in work that uh, Andrew Peacock and Simon Stewart did uh, years ago when they had a look at the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension. You'll see here that the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in the so-called expert centre, the Scottish Pulmonary Vascular Unit, was half that of when the group looked outside of that expert centre and looked at all of the patient population uh, throughout Scotland. And I, I make these points um, to, to highlight a, an issue that I think that takes us, um, that, that we'll just listen to uh, Donald Rumsfeld. There are about. reports that there is no evidence of a direct link between Baghdad and some of these terrorist organizations. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. But, <laughs> excuse me, but is this an unknown unknown? Uh, I'm not. Several unknowns, and I'm, I'm just wondering I'm not if this going... is a... <laughs> And I think that highlights the point that there are a lot of things that we don't know that we think we know that perhaps we don't know that we don't know. So big data and, and perspectives around big data. And this is a passion that I've had for a number of years. And with my colleague, David Playford from Western Australia, we've been working on putting together the biggest echo database in the world. And, and, and with my other colleagues who are in the audience here, Greg Scalia and, and David Salamire, and I'm not sure if there's anyone else here, but. Um, We've been working through this to build what we're calling the National Echo Database Australia, so-called NEDA, and we've had that uh, methodology and rationale paper published in the American Heart Journal recently. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of things um, out of this data with regards to the tricuspid uh, regurgitation. So this is a vendor agnostic database of echocardiographic parameters, all linked with mortality. We have a process of automation, if you like, so the data is transformed, the variable names are transformed, the units are converted to a standard metadata dictionary. Uh, there is a, a filtering process applied to that where all of the, the, the variables that are impossible variables, the, the zeros, the negatives, etc., are removed, duplicate studies uh, are either merged or, or uh, removed, and, and the unique identifier is given to that patient. Things are reordered. And this happens in an automated fashion. A unique patient identifier is created, and then those, those patients are then inserted into our uh, national ECHO database. So currently, we have 1,113,383 studies 
on 702,000 patients, which equates to 38 million individual endpoints. We have nine separate vendors with 21 private and public hospitals contributing to this across uh, seven of the eight states across Australia. What I'd like to do now is to, to talk to you a little bit about the, the, the topic here, which is perspectives on mild to moderate tricuspid regurgitation. Out of the 530,000 um, investigations on 340,000 individuals, we ended up with 313,492 individuals greater than 18 years of age. And you can see here that there was a fairly equal um, split between the males and females with an average age of 61. You can see a median follow-up of 1,151 days. Important to note uh, earlier, um, I think someone said that uh, one out of three patients couldn't have a, a TR measured in our study. It's nearly 50%, and I think that um, is evidence of what happens in the real world across um, non-expert labs, let's say, around Australia. So 157,000 individuals with um, the ability to estimate the, the um, pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Using conventional wisdom, we were able to uh, demonstrate that 11% of the population had so-called mild pulmonary hypertension, and that was defined as a pulmonary artery systolic pressure greater than 40 millimetres of mercury, assuming 5 millimetres of mercury for the right atrial pressure. We, we were able to demonstrate that 4.4% of the population had so-called moderate pulmonary hypertension, that is uh, between uh, 40 and, and um, 50, and then severe between 50 and above. So you can see here, as I, as I was just alluding to, if, if you take this from a standard conventional approach, this is the, the perspectives here, if you, if you go and have a look at exactly what we've been taught, that is that less than 40 millimetres of mercury is no pulmonary hypertension. If you have a look at 40 to 50 being mild, 50 to 60 being moderate, and 60 and above being severe, interestingly, you, you expose exactly what we've been taught, that that's, that's um, a, a significant change in mortality within that patient population. However, if you change your perspective and you look at this from a pure statistical spread and you truly look at the quintile distribution of this patient population, what you find actually is that the divergence in mortality that you see from 40 to 50, in fact, you start to see that divergence in mortality around 30 millimetres of mercury. And so with, with this visual representation, um, of all-cause mortality and our, and our model plots, we decided to actually investigate whether this, this 30 millimetres of mercury was a pivot point uh, or not. And I should say that these data are under final review um, and should be expected for publication uh, in, in the next couple of weeks. So what we did to, to analyse whether this, in fact, pivot point was real or not, we looked at the 10 millimetre of mercury less than our pivot point and 10 millimetres of mercury greater than our pivot point and in, in this population here, this is about, um, uh, about 40,000, 45,000 individuals. Whoops. 45,000 individuals here uh, that had a, a right ventricular systolic pressure between 30 and 40, and about 88,000 individuals um, from 20 to 30. And you can see here that you get a fairly uh, stagnant mortality rate up through here. And once you hit the pivot point, you have a linear progression that continues to rise um, over time. And so most people would, would be thinking, well, OK, this is predominantly left heart disease, as we've demonstrated primarily. And so what we did was we actually accounted for the left heart disease and adjusted um, this patient population. And the, tr and the, the same trends exist um, for this po patient population. You have a, a fairly flat mortality. You reach the pivot point, and then you continue to increase um, over the next 10 millimetres of mercury. And that continues to rise over the remaining subsequent incremental increases in pulmonary artery systolic pressure. So in fact, perhaps the big data perspective of looking at so-called mild to moderate um, pulmonary hypertension, we need to reflect a little bit on whether our current thinking is in fact um, correct. And to, to further validate this under a couple of reviews, we, we wanted to figure out exactly whether this pivot point was maintained throughout the life spectrum. And so we did this in age epochs from 20 to 25, 25 to 30, 30 to 35, and you can see the rest. You can see here that the black bars represent the 30 millimetre, 30 to 32 millimetre population. And you can see consistently throughout the age, the incremental jump in all cause, and, and just 
I haven't pointed this out, but it's remiss of me not to, is that this is actuarial survival. These are not Kaplan-Meier curves. These are uh, presentations of the actual survival for five years in this patient population. And although the gap reduces over time as the population ages, this incremental pivot point, if you like, continues to um, persist. And we've done this, this analysis with those above 65, those below 65. We've done this with all-cause mortality. We've done this in, with those with the mortality related to respiratory disease. We've actually looked at this um, from all of the ICD coding, all of the secondary causes and the antecedent causes of mortality. And this pivot point, this so-called threshold of 30 millimetres of mercury, continues to persist right across this entire population. And interestingly, uh, recently, the proceedings of the last World Symposium were published, and, and David Salamai is in the room who was on that task force, where the hemodynamic definitions were updated, the clinical class classifications of pulmonary hypertension. And the consensus here, which is a bit of a complicated story, but basically the, the new definition of the mean pulmonary artery pressure of 20 millimetres of mercury now being the definition, the hemodynamic definition of pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary arterial hypertension needs to have a, a greater than three wood unit in pulmonary vascular resistance. But if you do the maths on that, the mean pressure of 20 um, using the, uh, the formula of 0.6 plus two millimetres of mercury from an, from an estimated pulmonary artery systolic pressure to a mean pressure, um, as it turns out, 30 millimetres of mercury equates to a mean pressure of 20 millimetres of mercury. And I'll let you... Um, conclude uh, whether, whether our data support that um, or not. But I think what this, the, the perspectives aspect of this brings me back to the known knowns. And I guess, you know, a few months ago, we would have definitely said that we know that the definition of pulmonary hypertension is a mean pressure greater than 25. And we would have had a false known known now that that pressure definition is greater than 25, because of course, our now known knowns are that that mean pressure is greater than 20. What I absolutely know is that there's a lot of stuff we don't know. Um, we, we certainly don't understand the true global burden of pulmonary hypertension, and I think that these data um, emphasise that pulmonary hypertension, as evident by a, a mild to moderate increase in, in tricuspid regurgitant velocity, um, is incredibly important, and of course a whole heap of things that we don't know. The implications of that so-called mild to moderate tricuspid regurgitant velocity and the risk and action can be highlighted when you look at the ESC guidelines looking at this so-called traffic light of, of low risk, intermediate risk and high risk. And if you take that traffic light system and you apply our data to that, you can see here in the middle where you would be quantified as intermediate risk, applying our one and five year actuarial survivals, one being in black and five, uh, five year being in blue. You can see that in the population of 35 to 40 millimetres of mercury, there's a 40% five year mortality rate. And um, I would challenge you that uh, if that was my, me in that situation, I certainly wouldn't think that I was in intermediate risk. So I think that the accessible populations that we study sometimes may not represent the target population that we're looking for and therefore mislead our decision making. Mild tricuspid regurgitation, equivalent to an estimated right ventricular systolic pressure of 30 millimetres of mercury, appears to be an inflection point for increased mortality. Certainly in our cohort, 3 to 3.2 metres per second for tricuspid regurgitant velocity was associated with a 40% five-year actuarial mortality rate. And I think that uh, to conclude, our known knowns may not be our known, true known knowns, but our unknown unknowns are definitely unknown. Note the angle of the phone. You can all have a bad day. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>